Hello and welcome to today's Live Love Work Port Phillip Navigating Now session. We'll just wait a few moments while people uh, dial into the webinar and we'll get started soon. But what I might get you to do is while we wait, just um, open your chat function, toggle the two to be all panellists and attendees and just pop in there your name um, and where you're joining us from today and we'll get started shortly. Okay, so uh, my name is Georgie. I'm from Fetching Events and Communications. I'm one of the co-founders of Live Love Work Port Phillip, along with Alison from Roadmap Strategy and Vesna from The Incubator. And we're thrilled to have you join us here today for the third in our Navigating Now session. Um, welcome, we've got Alison, Anna, Pam, wonderful to have you join us. Please do join us in the conversation as we go along. We have a very special treat for you today. Um, so we might, if we've got most people on board, we might get started. So as I said, this is the third in our session of Navigating Now, which we started when all our worlds were turned upside down um, in March. And it's been our honour to bring you panel discussions and, and particularly our honour to have Peter Smith join us today to help us um, navigate and manage our way out of COVID. Before we get started, I would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians on the lands of which we're all meeting today uh, and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. And that's particularly, um, I guess, important because we are coming together from, from many lands around the country. So we all know this is incredibly challenging times, um, but I guess in, in times of chaos and disruption, opportunities do exist and opportunities do present themselves. And, and that's what today is about, really finding out um, what we can all do um, to help our businesses, whether it's in retail, whether it's professional services, community association, um, whatever it is, what we can do to get ourselves in the best position, ready to manage our way out um, of this situation. And I'm thrilled to have Peter Smith join us today from Business Profitability, who's going to help us. And it's a real treat to have him join us. Thank you, Peter. No problem. <laughs> um, so a little bit about Peter. He, some of you might know him actually because of the two Telstra stores that he has, one in Port Melbourne and one in South Melbourne. So you may have actually been into his stores. Uh, but Pete has been worked with a lot of leading um, global organisations, including Apple, Telstra, Goodyear, Samsung. Um, and as I said, for the past seven years, he's been um, operating the Telstra fan franchises uh, in Melbourne um, and surrounds. So he's going to talk us through scaling up, and he's actually only one of 11 um, registered coaches of this process in Australia. So we are very lucky to have him here and to have his time today. So I'm going to shortly hand over to Peter, who is going to take us through um, his presentation. Uh, we'll go to about 10 to 11, um, and then we'll stop for some questions and answers at the end. So I do invite you to post your any comments or questions in the chat function, um, and then we'll get to those at the end um, during the Q&A function. So as I said, join in the conversation, post any questions as we go. I'll be making a note of them and then check back in with Peter at the end. Um, so I am going to hand over to Peter uh, and the stage is all yours, Peter. Terrific, Georgie. Thank you. And it's uh, fantastic to be here today talking to the Port Phillip business community. Uh, as Georgie mentioned, my journey in Port Phillip started on the 1st of June 2013 when we first opened the Telstra store on the corner of Clarendon and Coventry Streets in uh, South Melbourne. I'm still a director of that business and also the uh, uh, the store in uh, in Port Melbourne, and I also uh, am very fortunate and privileged to serve in the South Melbourne Placemaking Group. Today, we're going to enorm uh, examine the enormous challenges uh, facing all businesses globally as we begin to emerge from COVID-19, and the critical importance for us all to obtain focus, to review and ensure that our strategy is truly growth-centric, um, to care that, that that strategy is flawlessly executed, your people are happy and engaged, and not just our people, but also our, our vendors, our suppliers and key stakeholders. While 
always making certain that we have a fortress bulletproof balance sheet. More than ever before, not changing is not an option. The business landscape globally has changed forever. Uh, and with unprecedented chaos, uncertainty and disruption. And more than ever before, what got you here won't keep you here. Uh, just as a little bit of an icebreaker, I just wonder if you could pop into the chat box and just give us one or two words which perhaps encapsulate uh, uh, exactly what you're feeling now as uh, we begin um, to uh, to hopefully on Sunday re-emerge back to um, uh, to a partial uh, reopening of the economy. So really just a phrase which is um, uh, central to the way that you're feeling now. And we'll run through those. Hey, Georgie, I can't pick the chat box up from where I am. Are you able to run through what people have written? Yeah, absolutely. As I sure. Um, I'll leave that to you. And don't be shy. Um, I think we're all, I think there's probably 20 words I could write down <laughs> how I'm feeling. Um, oh, and and it's, a, it's a family audience, so they've got to be. Uh, <laughs> exactly. Uh, I'm, I'm, Say from my, you know, I'm tired, but uh, but I'm excited. Yep. Um, Alison, I'll believe it when I see it. Yeah, I think there's certainly that um, uncertainty of, you know, when will we be able to get back to normal? I know I run an event business, so trying to plan live mm. events is uh, there's a lot of what ifs, um, even down to seating plans. Not, you know, we could go from a capacity of 500 in a room to to 20. Well, maybe not 20, but 120. Um, Heather, yeah, worried, but ready to get going. Yeah, I like that, ready to get going. And I think... Yep. Uh, okay. Sure okay, look, thanks for everybody's contribution there. Um, as I said, my name's Peter Smith. After 35 years of uh, corporate retailing, being very fortunate to work with some uh, some leading global organisations and having the last eight as a uh, business owner in the telecommunications industry in Port Phillip, uh, I've established a business coaching practice um, uh, and we're one of only 11 certified scaling up coaches in Australia. And we really work with ambitious and uh, CEOs and their management teams to achieve their, uh, their profit and growth goal. Many organisations start up, but a uh, few scale up. And there's been some really notable, notable Australian success stories that have successfully implemented the program, including Stop Farquhar, uh, that everybody knows, the co-founder of Atlassian. Uh, Naomi Simpson, the founder of Red Balloon and is also a judge on Shark Tank and Glenn Richards from Green Cross Pet Barn and uh, also a, a, um, a Shark Tank judge. Uh, one person operation re operates very differently than that of a 10 or even a 100 person operation. And regardless of its size, it's essential that the leaders of our businesses overcome three key challenges and the most important of those is the challenge of, of leadership. And that's to firstly delegate effectively to the right people and have systems in place to control accountability, performance management and your award and recognition program. Secondly, to, to predict and respond to emerging trends and staying closely in touch with your marketplace and frontline staff uh, and your customers. And thirdly, and most importantly, to relentlessly repeat execution with everybody moving in the same direction. The Scaling Up 4D framework is a really a core of, of only four sets, and it's in, intrinsically simple, four sets of habits and routines. Firstly, um, drivers, uh, which are championed across um, coaching, continuous improvement and technology, uh, balancing the demands between people and processes, and that's, a, uh, that's an every day and every hour um, uh, function. Develop rigorous disciplines and routines across priorities, and your meeting rhythms, and the decisions based on asking the right questions and only in four key areas, your people, strategy, execution, and cash. With that, and the organisations that have uh, implemented the Scaling Up program have reported a doubling of their free cash flow, um, a trebling of their, in, uh, of their profitability relative to their uh, industry average, and up to a 10x increase in their business valuation. There are four key decisions I said that a foundation support of the scaling up performance platform. Um, 
All of those uh, scaling up uh, tools we'll discuss today are shown in the handouts that Georgia will uh, will send out, and I'm happy, very happy to have a uh, a one on one with any um, uh, anybody that uh, would like some more information on the tools. Firstly, your people. Are your stakeholders happy and engaged in the business? And most importantly, would you enthusiastically rehire them? Can those people and, and, and you as a business owner clearly articulate your strategy in very simple terms? And is it bringing sustainable growth and profitability? Are all, with regard to execution, are all of your processes running smoothly and without drama? And most importantly, cash. Do you have steady and ideally internally generated sources of cash to fund and power your growth? And as we'll see this morning, growth sucks cash. The key question with people, as I said, would you enthusiastically rehire them? And knowing uh, what you know today, and if you're sitting near your bus, you might want to look away, um, knowing what you know today, would you rehire these people? And that just doesn't uh, limit, uh, that question's not limited just to your people, but also to vendors, partners, and advisors. We need to have the right people in the right seats doing the right things. So let's define what right people means to the organisations. Hope won't crowd an A player. You need to have decisive action, particularly about uh, those members of your team that you might categorise as a T player, as, as a B player. Can you train them up to, um, uh, to be an A player? And a number of them can. Any member of your team that you might consider as a C player really does require you to make some, uh, some difficult but necessary decisions. Scaling up uh, advocates the use of a, uh, a talent assessment chart. And it, it involves facing out some hard tr um, truths in your business as you, uh, you plan for uh, the remainder of 2020. And it's a simple exercise to group your A, B and uh, C players and those that, as I said, sit on that borderline between uh, B and C. Uh, and it uh, measures productivity and how they represent your core values. Uh, so you want to get your executive team to rank their managers on that same grid, and it's a um, fantastic approach that we uh, that we advocate. More than ever before, re recruitment is a marketing function because the top talent that you would like to bring into your organisation are probably in um, rewarding jobs at the moment. To find them, you need to fish where there are fish. When an organisation acknowledges the importance of attracting this top talent, you then need to move to the retention of the A players that you've already got. The second scaling up tool that we use is a one page personal plan, which is a, um, um, an exercise used to map out those individuals life goals within your organisation. Because we only experience how people come to work in. And the key here is to tap into the collective and creative intel of our people. And it examines their personal decisions that they make and their motivators across relationships and achievements and also measures their align with your core values. The ascension thing is to get the right people in the right seats, particularly at the top of the organisation. The scaling up tool which defines those seats and who's sitting them, sitting in them is the function accountability chart as we call it the face tool. It clarifies those people who are accountable for scaling the business and there are four main sections and hopefully there you can see I've got a, a laser pointer there. Here we put the functions which are those functions that every business must support uh, across marketing, R&D, finance and they can be functions that are either done in-house or you perhaps outsource as well. The people accountable, you assign those persons that are ultimately accountable for delivering that function. The leading indicators, the core KPIs that apply to each of those, um, those functions, and we encourage all of our clients to keep that very simple, don't overcomplicate it. And the results and outcomes, and they're going to be those P&L or balance sheet items that are on the financial play, uh, statements, which are linked to all of these key, um, key functions. And once you've completed that tool, you need to ask yourself a couple of really important questions. Are you enthusiastic about each of the people that you've assigned? 
does you ha do you have a name appearing all at, all at once? And that's not a bad thing, particularly if you have a small organisation. But are there any glaring gaps? You'll quickly be, then be able to identify whether or not you have right people doing the right things, particularly with those A players who don't need to be managed and will regularly wow those people around them with their insights and output. We now need to align the right people in the right roles to make our customers' lives easier and our customers touch every part of our organisations. Think in terms of the customer um, journey because uh, organisations will group our people by function, but our customers travel across your organisation chart because as I said, they do touch every part of your organisation. Modern organisational charts are now essentially vertical. It's essential that we as leaders think in terms of the customer journey and never lose sight of the fact that our customers touch every part of our organisation. The final uh, people tool we use is the process accountability chart or PACE tool. And it deals with the problem of cross-functional chaos by assigning those company-wide processes to a single accountable party. And we work with, our, with uh, the executive teams and our clients to define four to nine key processes um, that will drive your business. And that's across sales, customer satisfaction, finances. And those processes and accountabilities make sure that the business runs smoothly. For each of those key processes, you must decide who will be accountable and determine those KPIs and in time map the process. As we saw earlier, A players are not waiting at the bus stop waiting for you to pick them up. And they're already in, in rewarding jobs. The Scaling Up uh, Performance Platform advocates the use of the top grading hiring and promotion method, which was developed by Professor Brad Smart uh, from Harvard in uh, the United States. It hiring promotion that uh, uh, process um, that top grading utilizes, utilizes a group of a job scorecard, which, which challenges our traditional um, views of uh, position descriptions by really drilling down into a job's purchase purpose, its desired outcomes, and the desired technical and cultural competencies. And it will identify those candidates who best fit your job and your culture. Take an honest look in the intention of your organisation. We'll look out at your strategy, and is that strategy driving results? And are those results sustainable? Because strategy is ongoing. We're gonna break down the solution to the strategy question into three simple catchy components which provides the framework for the rest of our presentation this morning. And that's looking at your organization's vision, your point of differentiation and your brand promise. What do your customers expect from you? So what do we mean by the word vision? It's the direction, the mountain you're trying to climb to get your team to follow you up the mountain, and it's a long climb, you need to be able to clearly articulate the view from the top of that mountain, even before you've started the climb. Your core vision should be everywhere and very visible to all of your people. Because could we explain that vision summary may not be the best first step? And it's not an easy task, because if it were that easy, every company would have a killer strategy. It can be very uncomfortable for a lot of CEOs because we find that um, um, they believe that their people should uh, expect them quite rightly in some cases to already have the answers. Because after all, it's their primary job to set and drive the strategy for the business. Well, now introduce strategy as a tool for differentiation, your real competitor, a competitive advantage. It's crucial to understand where you stand. We find that uh, traditional SWOT analyses are too narrow. Instead, we advocate the use of a SWOT analysis, analysis, which is strength, weaknesses, and industry trends to best understand the position of your organization in the context of those trends and competitors. And it's really a tool for defining your competitive position. What promise does your organization make to your customer? Because every business does. To develop your brand promise, you want to ask three questions. What does your core customer expect from you? 
What do they count on from you? And what do they find unique about you? The key to define your brand promise quantitatively so you can measure and monitor them. And there's an example uh, that we use from, a, uh, from an e-retailer and those qualities that um, uh, best desire that score, uh, that core customer is short on time values, um, in, enjoy old fashioned service and prefers to communicate by phone and rely on a 24 seven communication. We now want to declare your brand strategic agenda in one comprehensive framework, which really pulls together the work that we've done on our vision, our differentiation and our brand promise. The seven strata is a comprehensive framework for creating a robust strategy that differentiates your company from the uh, competition and helps you establish the need, of, uh, the, the kind of roadblocks that allow you to dominate your niche in the marketplace. The questions that you need to ask yourself to make those key strategic decisions are firstly, the words you own. The customer's search engine, that small piece in the customer's mind that you own, and it's a really hyper-specialised hyper niche. You find in a lot of the documents within, and the working papers within Scaling Up, that the amount of space that you've got to be able to write comments is deliberately uh, quite small. So it does force us to have that hyper-specialised niche, to have a laser focus on what you represent. Your brand promises, as we said, is to what we sell, to whom, and where we do it. And your brand promise guarantee are those KPIs and what backs up the brand promises and reduces your customer's fear from buying from you. IKEA's got a one phase strategy, flat pack furniture, and it's become its market advantage. It removes the need to ship or to have warehouse space, IKEA's keep uh, costs lower their competitors, which is its number one brand promise. Yet like all strong positions, it doesn't come without trade-offs. Who hasn't been lost in an IKEA store before? Strategy is crucial to the growth of your business, but depending on the maturity of your business and where, it, uh, where it's situated, you may need more time to really get on, be clear on your position. To deliver the IKEA experience, they get their customers to drive out of their, out of their way because they're deliberately not in central areas. Um, they drive out of their way to these labyrinth-like stores. Then you, th they uh, deliver the product to their customer in a flat pack and you've got to take it home to put it together. It deters some potential customers, but with 6.8% global market share, IKEA is the world's largest and most profitable furniture chain. We'll now move to the uh, centerpiece of the Scaling Up platform, which is the one page strategic plan. It's one page, but it's across an A3 page. Um, to take accountable, uh, take action on strategy and to have a clear plan, it's gonna drive your alignment, your accountability and your focus. And it links the strategic thinking and strategic planning functions by asking eight simple questions. Who, what, when, where, how, why, should, and shouldn't. And we work with teams to workshop these uh, seven areas on the final result of the framework with a common language and routine. The one page strategic plan starts with your organization's core values, which is the should and the shouldn't. And it's the handful of those rules within your organization that remain constant. That because those rules remain constant, they've got to be some punitive action elements for violations. Would you fire somebody for not living your core values? And it also has got to be something that you're prepared to take a financial hit for living those core values. The purpose is the why, the aspirational target for your business. And we work with our teams to make sure that it really engages and excites the employees. The actions are those um, functions that are necessary in the short run to keep the long-term visions alive. The profit per X is that single KPI, which is your primary economic engine. And finally, as we call it the BHAG, the big hairy audacious goals. Where do you want your organization to be in the next 10, 20, 25 years? 
The goals are those one-year targets and key initiatives that have to be hit in order to achieve that critical number. As you've seen, we've started from a 10 to 25 year and we're breaking it down into three to five, one, and then quarter. We then move to the actions, targets, and priorities that you've got to hit in the next 90 days to contribute to your one-year goals. Column six is our quarterly theme. And that's that key quarterly target or critical number that you need everybody to be aware of and everybody across. Uh, ideally, if you match it with a theme name, and the, one of the examples we use is uh, Southwest Airlines, which is the most profitable independent airline in the US. And they've got a very, um, uh, a, 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 um, a very simple theme that they call wheels up. They wanna have their aircraft in the air for as long as possible. Having this target and progress towards it highly visible via scoreboards around your business uh, in various high traffic areas is essential. The column closes with the identification and celebration of a reward for hitting that theme target. The final column is the who. Who's accountable for those various aspects of the one page strategic plan and details the KPIs, the targets, initiatives and the critical numbers for each of those employees or team of employees and an indication of the required time frame that they have to hit those targets. We'll now, function, uh, now focus our attention on the execution function. We've looked at uh, what's necessary to keep our people happy and engaged what we need to do to be able to have a killer strategy and have that communicated across the business. Now we'll talk to the um, execution function and the need to have uh, all of our functions fl uh, flawlessly executed. And Peter, I'm just gonna jump in here. Sure. Because uh, I'm conscious there's a lot of information that we yep. So I thought after the first two, we might just take a, a breather. Sure. Um, I know this is a lot of information to take in. Uh, and just a reminder, we will be getting the recording out to you all afterwards as well as- Absolutely. Slides. But we've got a couple of questions have come in, so I thought it might be- No, absolutely fine. Ask these now, particularly um, with people around, and I love the phrase, A players are not waiting at the bus stop. Um, where do you find these A players? Where is sort of- as we said, we, we, we've got to fish with their fish. And, and, and one of the things that Brad Smart talks about in, in top grading is, is uh, approaching your recruitment as a, as a marketing function and to make sure that you communicate to um, a pool of prospective employees about what's really great about coming to work to our, in our business. So when they, um, they finally see... Um, um, an advertisement in Seek or one of the uh, the employment portals that is for your organisation, and I've already made that connection of being a great place to work. Uh, they're all automatically favourably disposed towards that. The other thing that um, um, that is a great tool for um, uh, for top grading is your reappraisal of the interview process. And we've all approached the interview process in, in similar ways. And we just don't take long enough to do it. Um, a cost of a, of a mishire can be in excess of two times your, um, your employee's salary package for a year. By the time that you approach all of the, uh, um, um, all of the, the uh, uh, cleaning up of foul ups towards the rehire cost, towards the cost within your organization of a learning curve of bringing somebody else in and inducting through the organization. Getting it wrong is a, is a, a, a terrible impost on a, on a business. And taking longer and a more thoughtful approach to interviewing um, and Brad Smart to advocates anything up to a three hour interview, really drill into them, really drill into their, um, their um, uh, their values, making sure that they have a close alignment with what you represent. Because you might think that, oh golly, you know, three hours, who's got time to do that? Compare that with potentially having to, um, to write off the cost of two years salary just to clean up the cost of a mishire. Absolutely. And then I guess for people like myself who are sole traders that 
we hire contractors or we partner with other agencies or organisations. We treat that like recruitment too. We've got to make sure, sure it's an extension you know, of our business. Mm -hmm. The strategic plan, can I just say, I love that it's one page. You know, oh, it's one page on A3. I've got to be a hand on heart. <laughs> A3 because I think, you know, there's always this talk of strategic plans, strategic plans, and you think, I don't even, is it supposed to be a book? Is it, you know, what's supposed to be on this? So yeah. um, do you want to talk a little bit about, you know, why they kept it to one page? Look, it, it's kept to one page and you, you might notice, and if I, Look, I won't uh, flag, flag back to that slide, but there's there's a lot on it, and I'll send it out to everybody after this. And it's deliberately one page and deliberately not a heck of a lot of space to encapsulate what, what, what might take you 25 years to get on that journey. It's to force you to, to be really laser focused on what your core objectives are, what you want to achieve in the next 10 years and drilling that down in three to five years to one to quarter and having themes and responsibilities built around that. So it was quite, de it was quite deliberate to have it on one page to force us to be really, really specific and really purpose focused. No, I think that's great because it forces you, if you're someone like me that gets distracted by bright, shiny things, it forces <laughs> You know, really focused. So sure. I love um, excellent. Well, we'll kick back into it. I might get you to slow down a smidge. Um, sure thing. I yeah, look, I, I appreciate that there's a... Um, there's a there's Everyone's a, yeah. trying to take it in. But just a reminder, we will send a, a copy of this recording out uh, and you'll also have um, access to the slides as well. So back to you, Peter. Okay, thank you. We'll talk about uh, the execution. And the key question is really, are your processes running without drama? and driving industry leading profitability. Now, again, that's a very noisy slide and we'll send this out to, uh, to everybody, but it's, uh, uh, it's what we call the, uh, the Rockefeller Habits uh, Checklist. And it's the most popular execution tool that we use. It's based on a series of routines and disciplines that American industrialist John D. Rockefeller enshrined in Standard Oil over a hundred years ago. Um, Standard Oil is now uh, better known as Exxon and Chevron, and they're the largest oil company in the world. And his mantra was, don't give up the good to go for the great. There are 10 habits there and, and four um, pointers to each, um, uh, to each of the habits. And we generally work with our clients to roll out one, two, three to max that we would roll out uh, every quarter. So over the period of, uh, of an 18 months to year uh, period of time that you've rolled out and you've embedded in your organisation each of these habits. And just to very briefly cover those 10 habits. Firstly, is your executive team healthy and aligned with a, with a genuine amount of trust? Is everybody all, uh, 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 in your organisation aligned with that number one priority? Is there a communication um, rhythm for, um, for regular meetings? And we'll talk about the, that meeting rhythm shortly. Is there one person accountable for each key aspect of the organisation? Is there uh, an ongoing process to gather employee input, which you gather regularly to identify what you need to start doing, stop doing or keep doing? And similarly, you need to ensure that you um, gather your uh, customer inputs uh, regularly. How are customers going? What's going on in your industry? And how you're going in their eyes? Your core purpose and values, are they alive across all of your organisation and particularly embedded in your HR functions? Ask all of your employees whether or not they can clearly articulate your strategy, particularly your BHAG, your big hairy audacious goal over the next 10 to 25 years. And do they know your core customers and what your brand promises are? Everybody's got to have KPIs. At the end of a week, when somebody's walking out your door on Friday night, do they know, do, do your team know quantitatively how their day or how their week's gone? And finally, that your organisation's plan and performance have got to be uh, visible everywhere. 
So you might want to take some time when you get the um, uh, get the habits out uh, to your next week to reflect upon those habits that you think you practice well, and which of those could uh, could use some work on. I'd be happy to spend some time one on one with you to uh, help you turn that around. The three areas that we've, uh, we spoke about are, uh, within execution are the priorities, the data and metrics that uh, support those priorities, and your meeting rhythms. There are three sure signs that your strategy is being well executed. Your organisation does have profitability at three times your industry's average. You've got no drama from missed deadlines or uh, uh, mundane mistakes. Your people aren't working onerous amounts of overtime just to fix those problems. And you practice what we call the Stockdale paradox, where you truly believe that you will succeed and prevail, but also face the brutal facts, however difficult. Stephen Covey really encapsulated what we try and do at Scaling Up through execution. And the main thing is to keep the main thing, the main thing. And that's the importance and challenge of focus. Data and metrics support our execution plan and provides insight and foresight. We encourage our clients to think about what your KPIs should be and take care that industry KPIs that may not really matter to your business. School boards can take uh, many forms around the business, but should have a defined finishing line easy to update metrics and give a cumulative sense of your progress to your people so they can see where you're at and where they need to be. Well, meeting rhythms are critical to a solid execution. And as we say, routine will set you free. Your block time for, for communication to define your occurring agenda is really across four time frames to have daily meetings, weekly meetings, monthly meetings, and quarterly meetings. Before you start to think, well, I've got nothing else in my day except go to meetings, consider this. Your daily meeting is only ever very quick, five to 15 minutes. And it talks about, um, about what, what those items need to get set on. No follow up in daily, but otherwise it'll see like micromanagement. What's up in the next 24 hours? How are your daily metrics? Where are you stuck? How can I help? Your weekly meeting's got to deal with priorities and reviewing those priorities and get the updates on critical numbers. Your monthly meeting needs to really focus on a big issue. What are you going to focus on? Focus on a big issue. Um, how do you know it's a big issue? What's about thinking about your pattern recognition? What are the responses coming from your customers? The data you've collected in your Rockefeller habits that, um, um, that uh, are those conversations from your customers. What is, that, what is that pattern telling you? Your quarterly meetings really need to be about strategy. What did you do in the last quarter and what do you need to focus on in the coming quarter? Every meeting you have no matter what the frequency needs to have a who, what, when. And that identifies um, very simple terms, who's responsible, what they're responsible for, and when has it got to be achieved by. And the guideline has always got to be um, that, uh, that function or that, uh, that what has got to be rectified by the next meeting. We'll now for focus our attention to all, the all important cash position, making sure that you've got a fortress bulletproof balance sheet. Do you have consistent sources of cash, ideally generated internally to fuel the growth of your business? Ask yourself that question and ask your CFO that question because growth does suck cash. I know that cash can be a uh, intimidated topic, but before anybody makes a run for it, we're going to keep things pretty high level today. Uh, we'll start the combination, a conversation with finding the cash in traditional financial statements, and then dis discuss their strategy of cash using uh, a power of one tool and pricing. There are seven financial uh, levers that you can use 
to improve your cash. You can increase your price, you can sell more or increase your volume. You can reduce your direct costs and reduce your cost of sales. You can reduce your operating expenses, collect your accounts receivable faster, reduce your inventory and if you're a manufacturing company, your, your work in process, and you can push your uh, accounts payable out and pay your uh, suppliers uh, less frequently. At Scaling Up, we have a, sash, we have a saying, revenue is va vanity, profit is for sanity, but cash is king. To identify the leaders of cash, and as we talked about uh, its inventory, it's reducing your OPEX, it's reducing cost of sales. In this example, this company has delivered $18,000 worth of profit off $100,000 in sales. How do you do it? Remember those simple, those seven levers that we went, that we uh, discussed that you can manipulate to impact the, the amount of cash you've got left at the end of the day. And your strategies need to consider all of the variables. You'll often find business owners great, uh, say, great, I need to sell more volume uh, just to boost cash. Without taking into account your cost of production, you might find that selling more volume actually reduces the amount of ca uh, free cash that you've got. There's a variety of resources and complexity that goes into the cash decisions. And we work with our clients through some proven exercises that have helped hundreds of others dominate their industry and all of this to answer the cash question for their team. And we use a tool we call the power of one, which is um, about uh, incremental improvements through the concept of the power of one, which is a product of a uh, company here in Melbourne. One plus one plus one can equal 19. And that demonstrates in a, um, in a very simple term, how 1% changes in your sales, your cost of goods sold, your expenses can all generate in 1% increments can generate a 19% impact on your net income and cash profit. So a 1% increase in your sales, a 1% decrease in your cost of sales and a 1% uh, decrease in your overheads will impact your net income by 19%. And that's based on only 1% um, variations in those, uh, in those measures. The power of one's a fantastic tool um, to examining the net impact of those small changes. And I'd be really happy to take you through one-on-one -on -one to show you the impact of these changes in your organisation. We encourage our clients to have a mindset uh, shift around pricing, which is often the ele elephant in the room. You can increase both variables and it doesn't have to be an either or scenario. So we're going, to con uh, we're going to focus on the more confusing of the two, which is pricing, and run through a couple of quick strategies that you consider for maximising your price lever. After having spent uh, the last eight years in the telecommunications industry, um, brands like Apple have become a tremendous example of how pricing can make a really big statement on your brand. Apple charges a premium for its product, a top end um, um, uh, iPhone is now in excess of $2,000. It charges a premium for this product and continues to increase its profitability, even as the industry globally has become less profitable. Starbucks has done the same thing. They've normalized a $4 cup of coffee and that puts them in the same boat. It's interesting as a concept, so it doesn't necessarily offer us immediate uh, opportunities for improvement. So let's look at something that can. A great example of price segment is the humble can of Coke. At the supermarket, you might um, pick that can of Coke up for a dollar. In a vending machine on a railway station, it might be $2. At the airport, that very same can uh, of Coke would be $3. And at the MCG, and I think we all remember uh, uh, going there once, well, let's call it $6 and you walk away unhappy. Yet it's the same can of Coke. It's just more valuable in different contexts. When we charge one price, we're not able to charge more who th to those who are willing to pay more. And if we adjust our price, the value in terms of the benefits that the customer sees, we can capture our maximum profits. 
Range and bundle pricing is something that's commonly used in the, uh, in the IT uh, industry, and it's all about a technique uh, and establishing a good, better, best option. The best will have the highest perceived value, but it just doesn't give you more stuff because you can, as a business owner, control the choices and use your language to motivate customers to self-segment. And we work with our teams to apply range pricing and do it strategically. And if an example of an exotic pricing um, model is, is Costco. 60% of their uh, net profit comes from membership fees. That fee you pay Costco before you walk through their door and uh, fill your shopping trolley full of groceries. You need to be a member to shop there. Herman Simon is a global demigod of the uh, of pricing strategy and he operates a global pricing strategy company. And he says, growing through price is typically better than growing through volume alone. It's been a lot to go through this morning, but that's the uh, comprehensive scaling up uh, methodology and it extends far beyond just the pricing decision. The scaling up platform will show you a step-by-step -step process to successfully grow your company, generate increased profitability and cash, and most importantly, you'll enjoy the ride. So for anybody who'd like to uh, continue the conversation, we'd be happy to offer anybody in the community a no obligation one-on-one -on -one consultation to run through a couple of the tools in, a, um, um, uh, in an environment where we look at your business specifically, um, look at your individual businesses challenges and how perhaps you might uh, use the scaling up performance platform to take it to the next level. Uh, and we're also very grateful uh, for you to take a couple of moments to complete um, uh, a survey that Georgie will uh, will send out. It's really important feedback to us. So thank you very much for your time this morning and back to you, Georgie. Perfect. Thank you so much, Peter. And we've got some time for questions and I've noted down some as we've gone along. Fire um, away. Stop sharing the screen. Um, uh, okay, that's that red button says I'll stop share. There we go. <laughs> um, thank you so much. It. Uh, I've been furiously taking notes and, uh, and I, you know, it can be overwhelming when you're a business owner. Of what, what do I have to do? But when you break it down into doable sections hmm. and step through a process, suddenly it doesn't seem so overwhelming. Look, it's um, not. And, and, and it's, it's ostensibly, a, I know there's been a lot of content this morning and we'll send a pack of information out to you to go through in their, uh, in their own time. But it's really just, just, just getting those four decisions right. People, yeah. strategy, execution and cash. Absolutely. And I, I just noted down some things I loved, you know, don't give up the good to go for the great. Yep. Sometimes we try and jump too far ahead. Um, I found the meetings one really interesting because there's often a lot of talk about how do we avoid meetings for the sake of meetings? And I liked that the meetings were very focused, that they mm -hmm. recommended and sure. had you know, purpose. But one of our questions um, actually from one of our counsellors, Marcus Pearl, thank you for joining us here. What are your tips for keeping meetings fresh and vibrant? That they don't become repetitive and it doesn't end with blockers and it's all sort of metrics. Yeah, look, you're right. And, and that's where it goes back to ensuring that having your people happy and engaged in the business. Because if they, um, if they enter a meeting with that mindset, they're, um, they're not going to be those blockers. But it's making sure that, um, um, that your meetings really are focused around um, around specific functions and the daily meetings is really anywhere between five and 15 minutes to talk where are you stuck and where can I help yeah making sure people that are accountable making sure that you talk at the, the numbers but don't overcook it so it doesn't then become a chore um, and and once meetings become uh, and we've all been in organizations where there's been a meeting led recovery they do become meetings for the sake of being meetings Exactly. Um, and I keep, the like bigger, that, keep the big items less frequent. Yes. I, and I liked that point in those daily meetings that the action items don't come out of that meeting because then that just goes into another meeting. Yep. So yep. See how go. Now we've got a, a few minutes. So if you've got sure. some questions, pop them in. Um, I, I really liked um, routine will set you free. And I think that's been probably for, you know, some, some of us maybe who, uh, well, for those of us who are working from home, 
sort of, it's really hard to keep a routine, but I think just getting that structure and it's really a, just that discipline and focus. And I know from my point of view, I, I've tried to use the down, sort of look at the upside of the downtime. Um, mm. And I did some business planning this week and the simple um, exercise of moving away from my dining room table, which is where I'm set up to another room into the living room. And, you know, I had my post-it notes and my planning sheets. I was away from my computer for three hours. I didn't have any phone calls or any emails to get distracted by because I know I get mm. it. It made the world of difference in just getting a clear head and just that small change of scenery. Um, mm. Even I was like, I mean, I knew it would help, but I think I was surprised how much that would make a difference just getting away from the desk of that same desk I've been sitting at for six months. Yeah, you're correct, because the nature of the workplace globally has changed. Um, you can see I'm, I'm talking to you live from, um, it's, it's part office, part man cave, and I'm, I'm probably, um, uh, probably giving away a bit when you can see in the background, I'm a Melbourne supporter, so that's why I've got no hair. Um, but yeah, routine will set you free by having those meetings mm -hmm. and people knowing that there's a specific number of uh, core objectives, whether that meeting be held daily, weekly, monthly or quarterly. And the big ticket items, those ones that, that are more detailed, have more meat on the bones, are the ones you hold less frequently. Yes, yep. No, that's great. And, I, you know, the, the main thing is to keep the main thing. Main, the main thing, the main thing. I mean, if there's anything, I think that, that's a massive one. Um, the cash one, I love that one plus one plus one equals 19%. Um, percent. And, and just on cash, we've had a question here. What impact do you think brand has on price versus place of purchase? I, I, I think, I, I, and I come from, from, from a standpoint of being really fortunate with always working with global brands. And I think that, that, that brand prestige, that brand power gives you the capacity to, to, um, um, to uh, charge a, a premium price. And, and Telstra is a good um, good example of that. It's not an organisation or a service that is um, um, that is at the budget end of the pricing scale. It charges a premium for its product because it's a it's a powerful brand. What 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 brand will give you is the capacity to charge potentially charge a premium price, and at the same time, it gives you that ability to have range pricing. We looked at the can of Coke example, that can go from one dollar to six, and it's still the same can of Coke. Yeah, I found that fascinating. I mean, I know I pay different prices for drinks, but I just, you know, you sort of sure. don't think about the science that goes behind it. So staying on brand, how can local businesses, whether it's local in Port Phillip or local in another area around the country, how can local businesses build a, a prestigious brand? Look, I, I think the, the, the key differentiation that we spoke about brand promises are those things that you say to a, a customer and what do they expect from you? And that then becomes your brand building tool because if you're delivering on that point of differentiation, you're living your brand promise, you can measure your performance relative to that brand promise, your customers then will become your advocates. And, um, um, and I know sometimes when you... Um, when you say the word, would you mind taking a couple of moments to, to complete a survey? Make sure it's not long. Make sure it's, a, it's an opportunity for them to give meaningful feedback, which may not be what you want to read, and, and, um, um, but it's an opportunity to improve. And the collection of that, um, uh, of that data, and we talked about before about pattern recognition, gives you the ability to build your brand and, and um, grow the scope of your brand promise. I hope that answers that. Yeah, and it, I, it, probably in bigger brands or huge brands like Apple, if you yeah. work for Apple, you know the brand, you know yep. everything. But in a smaller business, sometimes, you know, it might be the, the founder has it yes. all in their head. Um, but it's really important that even if they've only got one staff, two staff or three contractors, that they understand it all as well because they're an extension of it. Yeah, sure. And, and, and just because you're, um, uh, you're a small business and we work with, with, with very small businesses, we work with very large businesses. And the, the reality is that the smaller businesses have a, um, a closer local touch and that's 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 one of the things that I that really in, 
really appealed to me about um, Live, Love, Work is that it's the collection of those local businesses because you've got that local touch. Yes, you're a small business, but it, 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 it doesn't make um, your brand any less valuable in relative terms. And it's that local reach, it's that local uh, activity um, supported with really strong advocate-like feedback from your customers that, uh, that give you your presence. Absolutely. And, and we touched on this briefly in one of our previous panel discussions that, you know, neighbourhoods, there's a lot of talk around how neighbourhoods will be shaped now um, in a post-COVID world and, and particularly mm. in the current world. So our neighbourhood is everything, particularly yeah. at 5K radius. So, you know, if you're a local business, you've already you've got that strong connection and, um, you know, people want to just work in that space. Sure, uh, and and the local the local reach also gives you um, the opportunity to be quite hyper um, laser focused on on your promotional activity as well. Because if you're, I know you're operating within a five k radius. Um, well, guess what? You know, on the assumption that everybody's uh, complying the rules um, with the rules, that's where your uh, uh, your buying activity is going to come from, and you can uh, narrow your um, your marketing spend in that area as well. Absolutely. Um, just, to, I think if anyone's got any last questions, feel free to jot them down. Sure. Uh, I know for me, things I'll take away is, you know, getting right people sitting in the right seat. Mm -hmm. so that's incredibly um, important. Uh, it's worth what you say it's worth. And, and I think that's, a, it's a really good reminder about how we do price things. And I know when I started my business a gazillion years ago, 10 years ago, and I had no idea what to charge. And I remember, thankfully, one of my first clients was actually an ex-colleague. And she said, if you charge too low, you'll look like a Mickey Mouse outfit. Correct. And people Correct. won't respect yep. you. And that was the biggest learning of, oh, yeah, I need to price myself. You know, I'm worth what I say I'm worth. Sure. And, that, and that's one of the things that Herman, that Herman Simon says. Sorry. Says, Don't, that's one of the things that Herman Simon says in that last... Uh, uh, in that last... Um, uh, slide is is that people are apprehensive to talk about pricing as if you've got a fantastic product and a fantastic offering your customers and a high level of acceptance from from the shoppers and um, oh well it's two hundred dollars is that okay and you become mm. in some cases particularly startup um, almost apologetic about asking what is a fair uh, reasonable and profitable price for you to operate under yes yep. Uh, just touching back on the, the local element, as I said, whether it's in Port Phillip and, um, and Live Love yep. Port Phillip was um, started for social connection uh, 18 months ago, I think. Who knows? Who knows? I'm in the COVID time vortex. But it's been amazing meeting businesses and working together and seeing you know, how we can strengthen um, our amazing community. One of the things that we've seen happening is businesses working with other local businesses and partnering. Mm. Have you seen that emerging, you know, whether it's in Port Phillip or in other areas? Yeah, look, look it, it is. And, and we work with, um, with a number of municipal councils and chambers of commerce in, in running workshops like these. And um, there, there is a high degree of, of cooperation between local traders because um, you know, as we see at the moment, um, um, businesses need to believe within themselves that they have a chance to re-emerge at the end of this. Um, many of them will only get one chance. And there is, yeah, a high degree of cooperation between, um, between local traders, some of which may be at varying levels of competitor. Yes. But there is a high degree of you protect your strategic uh, and your point of differentiation. But there's a high degree of uh, cooperation between those um, um, those um, uh, those traders, and and it enhances that local feel. Absolutely, and I, it is a mind shift sometimes. Someone that you've previously seen as a competitor actually becomes a collaborator. Yep. Someone that you partner with, and it strengthens strengthens sure. both your businesses. You know, for the good. No. So before we go. Um, sure. If, if there's one thing, and, and maybe if we sort of think about small to medium-sized businesses, mm -hmm. one thing that you would say to people to take away from today, um, and something that they could easily work on next, what would that be? Look, of the four questions, I, and, and it's probably the accountant in me that's, uh, that, that, that <laughs> says this, but I, I think the cash position is, um, 
is is crucial and um, the power of one tool that we use is really think of those seven levers and we looked at a one percent shift in your price your uh, your operating expenses and your direct costs a one percent shift either way in each of those will give you 19 percent look at your look at the price um, look at your um, all of those seven elements but if you're only going to look at, th at three things look at your price look at your direct costs look at your operating expenses and ask yourself a question can you can you charge a higher price can you reduce the cost to deliver that service both for an indirect and an indirect basis and and see what the impact there is and and um you'll be pleasantly surprised because uh as I said, businesses need now to believe that they have a chance. A lot of them will only get one. And, and unfortunately, that's the reality of the, of the impact of this, uh, of this pandemic. Um, and preparing now and use, using this um, enforced hiatus to looking at your cash elements, that's the one thing because hopefully your strategy is right. Hopefully the people are engaged um, and it's making sure that you really do have, a, as we say, a, a fortress balance sheet, yeah. um, a cash position that's bulletproof. And 1% and plus 1 plus 1 seems much more doable than trying to find 19% out of somewhere. So Correct. It's, it's suddenly you go, oh, I can, I, I think that. I can do that. And, that, you know. so, and, and, um, and we so see that all the time. You, you say to clients, can you increase your price? Well, I'm like, yeah. yeah. And, and, and you see the impact and then we work back from that. Yeah. And often the cash position is, we, is the first thing we work on. Yes. So you yes. can set your financial targets and work back from that through your strategy and execution. Yes, fantastic. Well, thank you so much, Peter. No We're problem. It's been a pleasure. So it's lovely to be involved. Very appreciative of, of your time today. Um, we know you... Um, the, what Peter presented can sometimes be, you know, a, a three-hour workshop. So we're, we're sure. very lucky to have it in um, in our hour. Um, and I know I've certainly been scribbling down notes to, to take away. And um, we will send the recording out. We have posted some links in the chat function. Uh, if you'd like to find out more about Live Love Work. Sure, sure thing. Or um, follow us on social media. And if you'd like to find out more about business profitability, uh, or even give Peter a call if you want to sort of explore this further. Absolutely. And, and, and we'll send a, uh, a summary pack through to you um, to next week to, uh, to um, uh, distribute to, uh, to everybody that's been today. Fantastic. Lovely. So thank you. thank you all for joining us. We wish you a, a safe and happy weekend. Uh, we hope the rain holds off today and we get a bit more of that spring sunshine. It's been but beautiful. it's been great having you join us for our third Navigating Now session. And, uh, and we hope we can all catch up soon, whether it's online or um, at a live event. Uh, for that would be fantastic. Take care. Have a Lovely. great day.